The Chicago L has a lot of unusual features, from an elevated rail loop, to wooden platforms, to blue platform edges, to really long platforms. A lot of stuff about platforms. But the Chicago L has one feature that is so unusual for rapid transit that it would make some people question fundamentally what the Chicago L is. Welcome back to RM Transit. If you aren't already, consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss a single transit video. If you're a big fan, consider supporting the channel on Patreon for a direct insight into what's coming next and for other goodies. Rapid transit systems do not usually feature grade crossings, from Toronto to London to Mexico City. Having cars, buses, and pedestrians cross your tracks is a big no-no, especially given how many systems operate using power rails, rails that provide electrical power to operate the system. Now, if you're wondering, like I probably did back in the day when I was uh, but a rail fan, how can a third rail train have street crossings, then let me explain. You first need to remember that large commuter rail systems in New York and Southern England operate entirely with third rail and have tons of grade crossings, so this isn't that unique a feature. Well, as it turns out, the solution from a safety perspective is a somewhat sealed pedestrian sidewalk with a little more protection uh, from the rails uh, than you usually see. And then the fact that trains are trains and trains are usually pretty long. And so uh, usually at any point, the train always has one section touching the third rail. And to be fair, even if a train is too short, it is possible to still operate as long as it's moving quickly enough that it can lose power temporarily and make it to the next section of third rail. Now back on topic. Yes, the Chicago L has grade crossings. And to be fair, it is one of the oldest systems in the world. And also other systems, rapid transit, like the New York City subway, have had grade crossings in the past, though not as many as the Chicago L. This raises a bit of an important question, since so often we talk about rapid transit and grade separation together. Is the Chicago L rapid transit? The answer is yes, but let me explain. Even when I talk about rapid transit, I frequently focus on grade separation. It usually comes together. Now, grade separation is where you have a system that does not have street crossings, or pedestrian crossings for that matter, or on-street running, where trains operate down the middle of a street, sometimes in dedicated lanes, and sometimes not. Truth be told though, having full grade separation is not actually a requirement for rapid transit, and you can think about that. There are systems with grade crossings which are quite fast, and there are systems without grade crossings, some of the monorails out there, that are quite slow. And to be clear, there's a big difference between systems with street running and systems with grade crossings. Now, many LRT and tram systems have street running. Now, as I mentioned, that means that trams run down the middle of the street and sometimes in a dedicated lane, sometimes in a sort of guideway that can have grass on it, sometimes it's just concrete. At the end of the day, though, what it means is that cars have the potential to quite easily drive onto train tracks. Not just cross them, drive onto them. By comparison, systems with grade crossings typically strongly demarcate the space that belongs to the trains and the space that belongs to cars. So you'll have things like signs that say don't stop on the tracks and uh, you know white lines or yellow paint on the street showing where you shouldn't stop your car so that a train doesn't get blocked or so that your car doesn't get hit by a train. There's an important distinction to make here. Systems with grade crossings typically get 100% priority over traffic. That is definitely not always the case for light rail or tram systems, where trams frequently, especially in systems with poor signal priority, stop at lights or go more slowly through intersections. This doesn't typically exist on systems with grade crossings. Now the total priority given to systems with grade crossings means they operate like they weren't even there. Trains operate quickly and gates come down. They essentially create a temporary right of way for the trains and the trains go through and the gates go back up. Now you might ask then, why don't we have more grade crossings on rapid transit? Glad you asked. Now to be fair, there are a few sides to this. For one, some rapid transit systems truly aren't compatible with grade crossings. The London Underground and the Vancouver Skytrain use multi-rail arrangements that wouldn't easily allow cars to drive across the rails. There's also the case of new systems being built, and when you're building a new system, the cost of grade separations, or at least avoiding major streets, feels like a minor cost in comparison to the scope of the project, and so you really don't often see grade crossings included in new systems. 
It's also worth pointing out that often these old grade crossings were sort of grandfathered in. The city grew around them and they were minor streets when they were installed. And sometimes, uh, you know, those streets become a little less minor, but they still tend to be minor streets. Of course, as well with new projects, there's a more of a desire for high reliability and safety. Uh, societal safety standards have changed substantially over the years. Uh, if you've ever seen photos of a skyscraper being constructed back in the 1900s, you'll know what I'm talking about. Of course, we also focus a lot on frequency these days, and with systems consistently operating on headways of only a few minutes, if not less than that, it makes a lot of sense to have full grade separation. Of course, when you're also developing a system in a city that didn't have a good rapid transit system as it, you know, grew up, then you're likely to have more wide roads and heavily trafficked areas that make grade crossings make less sense. You see, in cities like Chicago that were developing and didn't have automobiles everywhere yet, uh, a lot more streets were minor because they didn't need to be giant to handle all of the massive car traffic we've induced. Of course, there is also the safety angle. Since third rail power does predominate rapid transit systems, it just doesn't make sense from a safety perspective to have grade crossings everywhere because they are legitimately dangerous. Something you'll notice is that LRT systems, even those with a lot of separation, still more often feature grade crossings and part of that could be attributed to the fact that they have overhead power. Something you're actually seeing become much more common even with rapid transit, you know, subways and metro systems, just for all of the other benefits of overhead power. Something I could make a video on in the future if people are interested in it. Uh, leave a comment down below. So where do grade crossings make sense? Well, as I mentioned, one case for them is in a location where traffic is low and a street is minor. Another case could be in places where train frequencies are low. So on a branch, for example, where you might see, I don't know, a train every 15 minutes. It doesn't necessarily make sense to put in a grade crossing if the gates are only gonna be down for a short period of every hour. Of course, there's also the case of where grade separation can be very high. Even some lines that are pretty expensive feature a few grade crossings in some cities, and this is because the alternative would often be tunneling or elevating, which can be much more expensive. With all that said, faster train speeds somewhat counterintuitively can also mean that grade crossings make more sense. Faster trains occupy crossings for less time. If you have a train going at, let's say, 80 kilometers per hour, 100 kilometers per hour, and it's going through a grade crossing, it's going to clear the whole crossing, even if it's a very large train, very quickly. And so that speed also needs to be factored in with the frequency. A uh, very fast train, even operating at high frequency, might leave the tracks open for a lot more time. In that last example, I'm specifically thinking about Toronto, where I think we are over grade separating. We're building a regional rail network with seven to 15 minute frequencies and electrification, and in many cases, minor streets just don't need to be grade separated. There isn't going to be that much time the crossing is occupied for every hour, even at a fairly high frequency, and the cost of grade separations, particularly in North America, is massive. Of course, you also need to remember that crossings look different in different areas. North American little crossings are very poor in quality. They usually have boom gates for cars, which don't often extend the entire width of the roadway. They usually only extend to cover the part of the roadway that is facing the crossing, uh, but often there aren't gates for pedestrians. That's something we're seeing more of, but you can frequently just walk directly around a crossing. Uh, so they are quite dangerous. By comparison in Europe and Asia, there's a lot of measures you see more frequently. You see things on the tracks like anti-trespass pads, something we are seeing in Toronto, which kind of discourages people from walking around the crossing on the tracks. You'll see fencing that is usually pretty high and difficult to climb, which protects the right of way so people can't just walk over the tracks around the gates. You often see gates that uh, cover the crossing better, so they often cover the entire width of the crossing, and sometimes they even have sections which come down beneath them to uh, truly create what is, uh, you know, a dedicated right of way. And in some cases, in legacy areas, you see things like people who actually manually move grade crossings or who monitor grade crossings. Uh, and in some crazy cases, in places like Germany, you even have technologies like radar and intrusion detection that literally will sit at a crossing and detect if anything is in the way of the crossing to notify trains and the signaling system. So our grade crossings in North America are the low bar on grade crossings. I want to remind people that in my recent video on Tokyo, I mentioned that there are lines that subway trains run onto that have lots of grade crossings. So even the best of the best put grade crossings on their systems, even when it's a pretty frequent line. That's not to say grade crossings are desirable, but they're a trade-off and you make lots of trade-offs when you're designing rapid transit systems. What all this means is that when I say Canada has four rapid transit systems, Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa, uh, 
corresponding to the four fully grade separated systems, there is a legitimate case to say that no, the systems in Alberta, which are light rail systems, they're also rapid transit. They feature some grade crossings, but Edmonton in particular has a completely grade separated downtown. Calgary is a bit more iffy because it does have a transit mall, but the transit mall is pretty much fully dedicated to trains and buses. So maybe you can make some argument there. Nonetheless, Canada has arguably six rapid transit systems, but I prefer saying four. And why is that? Because while I do think systems with grade crossings qualify as rapid transit, I don't think in North America it makes sense to have grade crossings on a rapid transit. In some places where grade crossings are incredibly safe and the standard for engineering is very high and the experience level of both the public and operators with grade crossings is quite good, grade crossings actually can make a lot of sense. In North America though, we need all the help we can get because we struggle to provide frequent reliable service even with full grade separation. Now, while I think some projects which trade off capital cost for operational difficulty, like say building for too much capacity because you can't operate your trains efficiently, don't make sense. I think grade crossings, given their safety impacts, are something that we probably should remove because they have the operational benefit and the safety benefit. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. I think grade crossings I think grade crossing is giving their direct impact on I think grade crossings giving their dir I think grade crossings giving their I think grade crossings given <clears throat> I think grade crossings given their direct impact on safety are something that we do have to I think grade crossings giving their dir I think grade crossings giving their dir I think grade crossings giving I think grade crossings ah!